Right, okay, so welcome. So this, this is, dear oh dear, um, this is an interesting issue. It's an interesting topic. Um, Gabriel and I have made ourselves very unpopular. Um, and I was going to say, you, the, the, I don't think a writ has arrived yet at your door or my door. Um, but, well, they can come because we are cutting across some very, very deeply held beliefs about Finland. And those deeply held beliefs sprang up in the wake of the PISA study uh, and its first big international run in 2000, when Finland came top on a series of measures. Not all measures, but a series of measures. And was considered uh, immediately as being the destination to go to if you were interested in improvement. Now, why we're here today and, and why I'm going to talk for about five, six minutes and then introduce Gabriel. Uh, the reason we're here today is that, that I started to sniff around this stuff many years ago. Um, I, I'm head of research at, at Cambridge Assessment. We work in 170 countries and so we're privileged to be able to examine the way in which different uh, education systems uh, perform and uh, in the fortunate position of giving sensitive advice to people as to what they might do in their own domestic setting. And um, I've been to Finland a number of times and talked to Finns about their system. And I became intrigued by the, the seminars that were put in place around the world when Finns came out of Finland and sat there genuinely looking rather bemused as to why people were interested in them. And um, they didn't find it very easy to construct the narrative of Finnish improvement. And that was intriguing. Um, then certain top-line things started to be said. Um, autonomy is great. Schools in, in Finland are autonomous. And look where they are in Pisa. Um, and I'll mention a few of the other aspects of, of that kind of discourse around teacher training and so on in just a moment. But, but we began to, I began to be interested by this and a bit concerned by it. Um, there were a whole series of exchanges. So in the rooms upstairs, uh, there were Finnish researchers and Finnish teachers who came over for work, joint work with members of the faculty. And at various stages, I talked with them. And after a short period of time of asking questions about the period of improvement in Finland, they began to say, oh yes, do you remember the time when inspectors used to sit in the back of every classroom and make sure that we were realizing the comprehensive ideal? Autonomous, eh? Um, so at that point, I began to think, OK, all these top line assertions about Finland, we need to treat with great caution. We need to get beneath the skin of this and begin to ask some questions. It was really round home to me when I started the National Curriculum Review. And um, I'd gone into the National Curriculum Review making the assumption that we could identify some high-performing jurisdictions based on PISA, based on TIMS, and based on PEARLS. And people said, well, why aren't you looking at Australia? I said, well, with the ACARA new curriculum. And I said, well, who knows whether the ACARA curriculum is going to have a beneficial impact in, the, in, in Australia. It hasn't been implemented yet. As part of the study, what we need to do is we need to look at periods of countries' history where there was sustained improvement, often from a high base, and go back and look at what they were doing during and prior to that period. Okay, so unless you do that, you're making an ahistorical error of analysis. And that was a mistake that was made. As Gabriel and I have said, what people did was, oh, Pisa was top in 2000. Let's get on the plane in 2001. Let's step off the plane in 2001 and ask what Finnish schools are like. What they should have done is got off the plane and said, what were Finnish schools like when your 15-year-olds in Pisa, because that's where the data came from, started school? What were the schools like? And don't tell me it suddenly all fell magically into place the day they arrived in primary school. No, no, you have to look at when there was improvement and what the system was like 
during and prior to that period of improvement, you get a totally different picture. And suddenly the Finns stop saying, they asked a bunch of really strange questions about the education system in 2001, 2002. They start to say, oh, you're interested in the 1980s. Yeah, that's the real story. Now, the problem is with many of these, these <laughs> well, Lucy Crehan, who describes herself brilliantly as an educational explorer, <laughs> because she goes and teaches in a whole range of countries. Not for her, the kind of problems that, the, the, the kind of mistakes that many of the researchers make. They've got terrible confirmation bias. They go to countries to look at what they're interested in. And of course, they find stuff that confirms what they think. They don't look at things by which they're able to synthesize an interesting and challenging perspective, sometimes which challenges even their own views and theories. Amusingly, uh, when Gabriel uh, Helisargon published uh, Real Finnish Lessons, uh, the criticism from those who had told a very different story about Finland was that um, he's a right winger, so it's not surprising. Okay, he comes from a very liberal think tank. Yeah, apart from the fact that all the stuff that Gabriel's actually outlined in this actually is quite antithetical to some of that thinking. So how does that make sense? And what sense does it make merely to attack the, the, the institutional location of an individual? It's the evidence that matters. So one of the things that people people failed to look at, because of this confirmation bias, they didn't go to Finland and say, what forms of restriction have you got in your system? They said, do you have national tests now? No. Do you have hyper-accountability, as we have in some other countries like England? No. And those are just the wrong questions. If you say, what forms of restriction do you have? You will be told, oh, well, we get told by the state how many hours should we should spend on mathematics, which we are specifically ruling out of legal possibility in this country. The law prohibits the Secretary of State from telling schools in this country how many hours to spend on which subject. So which is the more autonomous at school level? Interesting. You see, the moment you begin to ask these program questions, and you ask the right questions in the right form, you get very, very, very different answers. Now, what we just need to look at is a kind of classic analysis and what's misleading. So Passy Sarberg wrote Finnish lessons. It was very powerful. It went around the world. I've had people stand up at lectures given by Passy, and they've said, yes, it's great to hear from Passy about the importance and the high status of Finnish teachers in Finland. And it's great to hear about a country where teachers are respected and really well paid. Yeah, but they're only paid marginally above the OECD average. In fact, when you factor in other aspects of cost of living, they're paid considerably less than teachers in England. And the thing is that possibly it's due to Finnish politeness. There isn't any attempt to correct these misconceptions drawn from the presentation of the Finnish trajectory in this account. So a lot of misunderstandings have arisen about school autonomy, about the form of education and the form of educational improvement in Finland. Now we've got a couple of revised accounts. There's our own stuff that we put on the website. There's Gabriel's brilliant stuff, which I will just introduce in a second. And let's just look at these. No national testing. That's misleading. During the period of improvement, there was, there was testing in every grade in order to determine whether the implementation of fully comprehensive education in that nation was working or not in terms of elevating educational attainment and reducing the equity gaps. No top-down accountability. Well, even now, that's, that's the wrong question. You're looking in the wrong place. All districts in Finland provide data to the central administration by which the central administration makes judgments about how Finnish education is going. It just isn't the same form of data that is submitted in the US or submitted in England. Hilariously, you will see all the, throughout the literature, there are no independent schools in Finland. Yeah, well, how is it 38% of kids 
in the Helsinki urban area go to independent schools. They're not allowed to charge fees. It's not they don't exist. They're just prevented by law from being able to determine their own fee rates. I mean, if there were no independent schools in Finland, how is it that the Association of Principals of Independent Schools in Finland go on regular study visits to America? Now, what we find, um, and this anticipates, this, this is Prince Gabriel's work, you, 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 analysts will attack the composition of these data and the way in which Gabriel has aggregated them. The detail, actually, doesn't matter that much. In fact, I approve very much of the way in which Gabriel has composed them. The point is, however which, whatever you look at, whether it's a qualitative account of a teacher, a collective group of educationists in Finland, you will get this same picture in terms of the historical trajectory. The improvement was from here. Not here. <coughs> 2000, yes, it was high, but look what's happened since. So what were they doing here to get this? And what they were doing there was a lot of social debate about what form of education they would adopt, fully comprehensive education, making sure that all sectors of society were prepared to buy into that and support it and drive it forward. Here, inspectors sitting in the back of every classroom to make sure that each teacher was not rescinding on the social deal around comprehensive education. State-approved textbooks, grade-related testing, and so on and so on. Here, you don't want to look at the schools there. You want to find out what was going on here, if you want to know about how and why they improved. Perhaps if you want to know about how and why they're doing that, you need to look at what they were doing there. That's a very different story, isn't it, to the one that we've read. OK, to finish, oh, sorry, <laughs> to close <laughs> my bit and come on to, uh, to Gabriel. Um, there were three basic phases. The setting of fundamentals and social agreement. High levels of social di discourse with the common agreement being implemented into a fully comprehensive model. High levels of restriction across all dimensions of education in order to secure the model upon which all members of society had agreed. Third phase, into th phase the fourth, Relaxation. That's when people went to Finland to ask some questions about how their schools were. But that's when relaxation was occurring. Different patterns of restriction were put in place. But even then you can find it in the way in which I've intimated. But also, phase the fourth, perhaps, is characterized by massive innovation and decline. Massive closures of rural schools. Changes in social composition in urban areas. What Gabriel and I did, we discussed very briefly the, the, the issues of ahistorical analysis. He was as concerned about the issues as I was. As a Swedish speaker, he was able to probe much more deeply into the culture and did a brilliant study visit to investigate further the things that I was concerned about and more and synthesized it all into this, this really, really impressive monograph. Um, He's gone further as well and looked at covert setting and streaming, which has emerged in the system. Where he and I differ slightly is that we're having a very important and vibrant discussion about the extent to which we need to look at social and economic changes in society and the extent to which the dis conscious decisions that were made about restriction, about educational policy, about transforming f Finnish education during that period were, were an, an, an absolute assurance of the improvement which they secured. Um, so without further ado, I will hand over to Gabriel. But just to assure you that all of the work in this and the, the, what you hear today is based on incredibly interesting synthesis work. Gabriel has been brave enough to go and talk to people who themselves didn't feel that their story was being told in Finland um, and has been brave enough to break the mould in terms of what beca had become a very, very dominant and really hegemonic discourse. And we think that evidence is there that causes us to break out of those kind of stereotypes. So, Gabriel, thank you very much indeed.
Thank you so much, Tim, for that kind introduction and for inviting me to uh, discuss these very important issues. As Tim now already highlighted, <clears throat> he was incredibly important uh, uh, to start with in this project, uh, partly for the historical analysis that he um, already set out a little bit in, in uh, a paper that you wrote for, for us, the CMRE, in a monograph on assessment, actually, so it's slightly different. But it's just this, this uh, highlighting how the system looked, uh, uh, what, what it looked like um, 30 years ago and what it looks like today. Uh, that was kind of the starting point in some of the stuff, for some of the stuff that I came to, to analyze in, in, in this book. So real Finnish lessons, as you also highlighted, obviously Finnish lessons, that's Palsy Solberg, similar name, slightly different opinions. Um, and the real Finnish lessons is, well, this is my story, uh, and a little bit of a reply to Palsy Solberg, of course. Uh, not only, because it go, goes uh, way beyond, I think, uh, uh, a reply to him, but it is it, nevertheless uh, some, somewhat of a reply to him. So I think we should start now, and I'll speak for about 50 minutes, and then I look forward to questions and a vibrant Q&A. Um, and we'll start where we should start, which is Finland's success in PISA. This, everybody knows this. Um, uh, in the first PISA surveys, uh, December 2001, the first survey was published, or the first results were published. Finland surprisingly achieved top positions in, these, uh, uh, well, in, in, the, in the PISA league table. I say surprisingly because nobody really cared about Finland prior to the PISA results. I spoke with one head teacher actually who uh, was involved in a Nordic cooperation project on education and she said, uh, you know, I, 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 nobody cared about us. This is right before the PISA results were published. Everybody looked to Sweden, a little bit of Denmark, we were left with the Icelandics. You know, that's, that seemed to be, she didn't seem to think that was a good thing, I don't know why. But either way, th this was a surprise to the Finns, it was a surprise to the world, okay? So uh, this is not, interestingly, you know, Finland per participated in other international surveys. It's just that with the emergence of PISA, you suddenly have this huge media interest in, in international surveys that hadn't existed before. And this, we will come to the other, other surveys in a minute. But anyway, PISA, success equals Finnish fame in education, okay? And this, as you all know, and as uh, Tim highlighted, kicked off this education tourism to understand what the Finns had done to produce such amazing scores. Politicians, journalists, they descended upon Helsinki uh, to, to, find, yeah, to find out and trying to learn if they could bring back something to their own countries and, and uh, uh, basically improve their performance as well. Um, and what emerged from these trips and the articles uh, was that the country's education system was seen as the key, as it looked uh, when they were there visiting. It was seen as outstanding, it received praise from journalists and politicians alike. It created something what I call a Finnish frenzy in the education world. Suddenly, this was the future. And I, the, it created a lot of kind of Narnia-like almost um, uh, accounts of how amazing the Finnish education system was. Um, some of which was true, some of which was not. But the point is that it was this kind of really excitement about the Finnish education system. And I, I just highlighted one here, which I think, this is in, published in 2012. It's actually a review uh, in a Swedish uh, newspaper by a pro philosophy professor who reviewed Posse Solberg's book, Finnish Lessons. And he said, I have seen the light, I mean, in the Finnish education system. This is the future. It reminded me a little bit about the American journalist who went to the Soviet Union and said, I've seen the future and it works. Uh, and then 50 years after, it was a slightly different story, right? But it was, it, it was definitely this kind of frenzy about Finland in the beginning uh, and attempts to find out what, what was going on in the education system. And what did we get? Well, there are so many explanations for why Finland is good. If you read, you can read one account in American newspapers, one account in a Canadian newspapers. This confirmation bias that you outlined so, so eloquently uh, pervades this issue. You can find anything in Finland, but I will just go briefly go through some of the more standard explanations. Uh, part, partly some of them have been uh, ex well outlined by Posse Solberg and others who are involved in, in the Finnish uh, kind of education export industry. Uh, and the first explanation is the comprehensive school reform. What was going on in the 1970s? Um, this was essentially just a reform built on the Swedish comprehensive school reform and the Norwegian before it. 
It was, it was gradually rolled out in the 1970s, from 1970, early 1970s to late 1970s. It essentially uh, extended uh, the period of compulsory education and, ex uh, and postponed tracking of pupils into different uh, vocational and academic streams um, until the age of 16. And this is supposed to have led the gra groundwork for this uh, egalitarian approach. And when you read some of the, the, the st standard accounts, it's almost as if before the comprehensive school reform, the dark ages reigned. And then after the comprehensive school, this was the, this was the path to Narnia. Boom. You know? So, so and what this uh, also, I think, is important with the comprehensive school reform is that it did also increase um, special education rapidly. So you have measures on the number of pupils who were in, in, enrolled and were give, given special education previous uh, to the comprehensive school reform and right after, and you see they boom during the comprehensive school reform. Okay? So that's kind of the foundation. That's seen as the bedrock of Finnish performance. Another important one, which is even more highlighted perhaps in the international uh, debate, is the absence of standardized test accountability in market-based reforms, or as Solberg calls it, the germ. The germ which has infected all these countries around the world, including Sweden, England, America. Uh, one, so Finland doesn't have standardized tests today, doesn't have accountability in the same way as we do. As, uh, obviously, that's a bit of an easy kind of simplified story as well, as Tim outlined. But it's nevertheless true that many of these things do not exist in the same way in Finland. Uh, and the secret then to Finnish success, according to Solberg, is that this germ has not infected Finland. The germ stands for Global Education Reform Movement, by the way, which is a neat name for it, I think. I think it did well there. Um, so that's one thing. And this, on the flip side of this, is that you have um, then collaboration and autonomy for professionals which are trusted, who are trusted to um, to do their work without anybody looking over their shoulder. And that's, of course, if you don't have standardized tests, if you don't have accountability and no market-based reforms, you're basically leaving the professionals to get on with things. And that's also supposed to be related then to high performance. Uh, and the reason why you can trust the professionals is linked to the competitive teacher education, which accepts about 10% in Finnish-speaking teacher education. We'll come to the Swedish-speaking teacher education later. Um, and all teachers have master's degrees. And this is supposed to generate great teachers, high quality teachers with high status in society. And then you have a link between these things and high status, performance, um, autonomy for professionals and schools, collaboration, absence of all of this. This, this is the story then. Okay. Um, the last thing I want to emphasize is uh, the less is more approach which is uh, what Posse Solberg, he, he calls it the less is more in his book, um, which basically Finland has short school days, not that much homework. And this is supposed to be linked to achievement by allowing teachers to collaborate more, becoming better at what they do. Um, and basically because the, the instruction loads are, is quite you know, low. It's not very, they, they, they don't have as many instructional hours as kids in many other countries. The same thing with little homework is a bit more of a mystery to me how you could link it. I mean, the idea is that children can play more. And if they're allowed to play more, they will learn more somehow. Um, but that's the story in a case. And I, I have to say, I mean, even though you, both Tim and I were involved in discussing these issues prior to or when this was going on when Finland was at the peak, uh, it didn't really make any headway, partly because they worked. I mean, these standard explanations worked as long as Finland was doing well in PISA and in any other, and all the other tests, right? They did. Now, I never thought that they were persuasive for many reasons, and I will come to some of them in a minute, but they worked. But then something happens then. And this is, I think, the why, why it got more attention in, uh, than it perhaps would have otherwise, because I wrote it after this, the success turned into decline. We've seen, I mean, in PISA, You've seen, okay, so here's the PISA results, average PISA performance across all three um, subjects. You see between 2000 and 2006, they improve. Those are not entirely reliable, partly because of the construction of the test. So you don't actually measure the exactly the same uh, uh, knowledge in 2000 and 2006 uh, when it comes to, um, sorry, 2000, 2003, 2000, uh, until 2006 uh, when it comes to mathematics and, and natural science. 
But either way, it's probable that it improved a little bit, but then what you see is a decline that's larger than in any other Nordic country, including my own, uh, between 2006 and 2012. And something happened. And the same thing you can see in other tests, which, again, no, didn't really make any media headlines. 2012, the results of TIMSS 2011 was, were published. And it revealed that Finnish 13-year-olds um, have fallen the equivalent of one school year in learning in mathematics between 99 and 2011. So eighth graders perform on the level as seventh graders did in 2009. Same thing with national evaluations, by the way. And the thing is, nobody really knows why. It's pretty much the same education system. Okay? Uh, Posse Solberg, in his book, uh, has some ad hoc explanation, in my opinion. He says that, oh, the reason why we, haven't, we suddenly start falling is because we haven't reformed more. And I say, so, so you're trying to say now that the, the features that you have said are the greatest gift to God and to mankind um, and, and, and re basically realize these amazing scores that you have are now the reason for the fall because you haven't reformed them away. I, I don't really buy that. I don't think it's a good explanation. You might buy it. I don't know, but I don't buy it. Um, and I think we need to, to look at uh, other things. You don't have to look at these. I mean, basically, so that, that is the puzzle. And we have to solve the puzzle. It's not that difficult, because just as you highlighted here, this confirmation bias. I mean, all of these standard explanations um, are not based, I mean, the ideas are not based on any research worth anything, really, I would say. It's based on this best practice methodology stemming from management literature, having basically now made its way into education, that you can look at certain features of certain systems and draw policy conclusions from them and how good they are, how bad they are, whatever they are. But the problem is it doesn't tell us anything about successful or unsuccessful policy either. Uh, just take this idea about the instructional hours. That the, the idea is that, oh, you have so fewer instructional hours in Finland, that's why you perform well. Well, think about maybe the Finnish kids are slightly different from others. Maybe they have more motivation. In that country, in that context, you would basically have uh, maybe, you know, you would, you would basically get the same results with fewer uh, instructional hours or even better results. So the point is that it doesn't tell us anything about uh, successful or unsuccessful policy. And that's, that's the essence of the confirmation bias that, that uh, Tim highlighted. So it doesn't really be based on anything. And it happens to be the case that the economics of education literature, uh, which I'm, uh, well, involved in as well, but uh, it happens to be the case that that literature and research contradicts the anecdotal uh, support for the standard explanations. And this is not only in one occasion, but many occasions. So you look at this idea that the comprehensive school reform um, was the key to success. Well, there, this is the only policy that actually has been evaluated by Finnish economists. Um, uh, Dr. Thomas Pekarinen and a couple of others uh, published in Journal of Labor Economics if you're interested in the details. Basically, they, they look, the reason why you can evaluate this quite neatly is because it was gradually implemented across the country. And, uh, and that meant that the same cohort of students or pu in different parts of the country would either attend the comprehensive system or would attend the, the, the stream, the tracked system. And their evidence, they look, albeit only, on 18-year-old test scores and male test scores, uh, but they find a very marginal impact. No impact on, on, um, on uh, basic uh, mathematics. Uh, some impact on verbal test scores, but it basically, it's a very marginal. And it, Dr. Pekarinen told me, he said, well, what we take away from this, regardless of the limitations in terms of understanding the PISA, because this is a different test, but what we take away from that is definitely that it wasn't the 1970s reforms that made Finnish schools successful. When it comes to accountability and competition, we can differ on how we like them, but the fact is, when you look at the evidence for uh, accountability um, and competition, it doesn't really suggest that it's bad, at the very least. All the evidence, for example, accountability, take uh, league tables. I mean, many problems with the league tables in England today, but there's been research uh, by Simon Burgess, for example, suggesting that one reason why uh, England performs better than Wales in uh, uh, PISA is partly because they, they abolished uh, league tables in 2001. Competition, a bit more global impact there. Um, uh, of course, contradicting the PISA report, but again, the PISA report, the fourth chapter, trying to analyze 
these uh, high-level uh, system characteristics and linking them to performance that is also based on simple correlations up and down, left and right. You can find anything with that approach. Probably the number of unicorns that you, know, you can read in newspapers as well or whatever, whatever it is, you can find a correlation between many things. Um, and it doesn't mean anything about causality. And I think even more, <laughs> even more interesting, just the example that I, I, I raised before was this idea of instructional hours. It happens to be the case that more instructional time now is linked to better PISA results. And it's good research coming out in the economic journal if you're interested in the details. Same thing with homework, that's a little bit pat more patchy. Uh, but there's no evidence that it's bad. And this is the kind of, this is, uh, so, so solving the puzzle is not that difficult because there was no real evidence that it was the Finland, Finland's current education system that produced the high scores in the early 2000s. Okay? But we don't have to look at the fancy econometric stuff, which obviously Tim now has already brilliantly outlined, that we can look to history. Um, because history also contradicts the traditional explanation. For example, until the 1990s, Finland's education system was centralized, controlled by the state, accountability system, inspection system. It also forced all the teachers to write class diaries in which they outlined hour by hour what they taught in order, and they had to meet the requirements in the very detailed national curriculum. Okay? The autonomization occurred, started to occur in 85, but most of it was definite. I mean, the, the finalization was with the 94 national curriculum uh, uh, I would say, um, which basically extended school autonomy much more significantly. Um, same thing with teacher education. I mean, teacher education was reformed all in the 1970s. So in the mid-1970s, uh, before, before the 1970s, actually, uh, the teachers, teachers were educated in teacher seminars, uh, separated from, from universities, mostly practical content. Um, then in the 1970s, that was lifted into pedagogical faculties, and then in 1979, primary school teachers were forced to have master's degrees. Secondary school teachers were already forced to have master's degrees in their subjects, not in pedagogy. And for them, the reforms merely meant that they had to do a little bit more uh, educational studies um, and, and in the new pedagogical faculties. And then, I mean, if the traditional account, we would, as Tim outlined, we would find that the performance is bad before the new system, the autonomous system, um, has been implemented. And we would assume that the system is poor before many of these teachers, or actually the labor market is dominated by the new teachers who've been educated in the new system. And if we look at that outline, it's not the case. It simply isn't the case. And this is actually, this is a standardized account of all different types of international test scores done by a couple of French economists. Um, it's lower secondary. Uh, uh, and it's a trajectory, as you can see. Finland starts improving already in 65, improving further in the 80s, and then right at the end of the centralized system, actually right after you ha they, have, uh, they abolished the centralized system, it starts, to, it starts to level off and eventually decline. Teacher education, come on. I mean, how many teachers had, had, had been educated at the, in the new faculties by 1980? Not many. The, the teachers who dominate the labor force, when Finland start improving in these te tests, uh, are the ones in the old teachers' se seminars who dominate, do, are not educated at university. Okay? We don't even need... You, you can. Okay. I'm really interested in that graph of what data that is. Okay. Um, yeah. It's... Yeah. So no, all of them have been standardized by a couple of economists by linking it to NAP data also in America. But we'll take the questions at the end and we can come to because I actually will show you we don't have to look at them. We can look at the actual results in TIMS. Ten-year-olds between 1783, ten-year-olds improved by equivalent of 48 to 59 TIMS points in science. They shared first place with Japan and South Korea in 1983. Okay? Always had top reading scores. In 91, Finland's both 14-year-olds and 10-year-olds perform top of the world uh, in reading. 1970, come in third place. They've always been good readers. Mathematics, they weren't always so good. But if you look at the scores again, they had the highest improvements between 
uh, no, it's 1965 and about 85 already. Not, but they were, they were not top performing in, in, in any way in, in uh, mathematics. But the point is, you can look at this as well. You don't have to look at the standardized scores. Anything shows that Finland starts improving. And we, I, I, will let you, I will let you come in later, but we, that's for the q and I'm sorry. Okay, when it comes to the army test scores, also show a similar picture. Army test scores are improving. These are, these are test scores that are taken by conscripts. Okay, slightly more like IQ, but some, of it, some parts of it are definitely uh, stuff that you can learn in school. The, 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 as you can see, they improve all the way up to 98 or 97, sorry, and then they start to decline. decline. This is all, mostly during the centralized system. When kids, remember, they're 18 to 20 year old, so they attended comp I mean, uh, basic education during the centralized system. And then it starts to level off and eventually starts to decline. This is not evidence that it is the centralized education system that produced these scores. It's not. It's part of it. You can't just look at that. But it's evidence to suggest that the new system was certainly not behind the improvements. A new story. Uh, that's, yeah, it's not that new because that's why I have the brackets. This is not new in Finland. This is what I realized. When you read educational sociological literature on Finland, you know that this is, you'll see that this is not a new story. Some of it has been synthesized in a different way, but it's, it's not particularly new, especially what I'm about to tell you about teachers. Um, and I think we need to go much farther back than the centralized system. And we need to go far, far back before Finland was even a nation or even a country. Um, because teachers, if you look at the literature, you can be clear that they've always had very high status in society. And I argue it's nothing to do with the current teacher education, and I will tell you why. Again, back to the 19th century. Finland is an autonomous part of Russia. It has inherited state institutions by, from Sweden, which left in 1809. It is what they call a quasi-state, because it has all the institutions, but it lacks one thing a national identity. It's a bifurcated society where 15% of the cultural and political elite dominate. Uh, uh, they, well, ba basically are Swedish speakers, right? Those 15% are Swedish speakers, 85% of the Finnish speakers are basically separated from that. And this is due, you know, this is the era of uh, national nationalism. And many of these Swedish-speaking, and Swedes, some of them were born in Sweden. Johan Snellman is, was the leader of this. Many of them believed in Hegel's idea that, you, you know, the, the um, end of history was the nation-state and the realization of the nation-state. And in order to get a nation-state, you needed a nation. There was no nation. Between 1809 and 1855, there were about 500 books in total published in the Finnish, Finnish language. Most of the books that were published also before, were religious texts. So these Swedish speakers realized that they could no longer be Swedes. There was a saying, we can no longer be Swedes, we don't want to become Russians, we have to become Finns. So they started taking Finnish names. They started saying, advancing Finnish culture and starting to build a non-existing Finnish-speaking culture. Essentially, uh, they, you know, one guy who wrote uh, uh, their national epic, essentially, well, he was not a, a Swede, he was born in Finland, but he, his name was Elias Lönnrot, that's a Swedish name. These people tried to create this new identity, and for that project, teachers were absolutely crucial. And they were not basically, I mean, what they were called, they were called the scandals of the nation back then. And this is something that still lives on if you read some of the literature. Candles of the nation, um, the vanguard of the nation, I would, I would call them. And this is not only in schools, but outside as well, because Finland is a, I mean, it's a laggard in many ways. And when it comes to, for example, compulsory education, it was implemented in 1921. This is the same year as Thailand. Uh, Sweden, Norway, Denmark did it in 1814. 1848, they introduced compulsory primary education. So, in the early 19th century, the education provision was so unequal between regions. 24% or 34%, 34% of the, 
of children in early, 18, uh, early 1900s attended school. 25% of the population were educated to that level. Uh, and of course, even when they implemented compulsory education, it took time before it covered the entire country. So in 30, 1937, right before the Second World War, you have 13% of children still not attending primary school. In that situation, it was necessary that teachers reached out to parents um, uh, as well and also to children outside of school. They became the candles of nation because of that. Uh, they were participating in political association. They were starting civic associations. They were crucial for the Fanamon nationalist project. And if, you know, when you give this type of role to a specific group, you want them to be quite good, don't you? If, you, if you're handing down the the kind of future of the country in their hands, you want them to be good. And they were supposed, they were absolutely supposed to be model citizens. So this comes from the idea of Herbert Sillerism, which is a, well, you probably might know it, G German pedagogical style. And the founder of the uh, Finnish education system, Junus Ignius, he went around Europe to look at different types of education systems and see what he thought would be good for Finland. And he, he thought that, that that style in Germany, that was good. Okay, and the idea is that you produce very, very, stri very strict. It's very strict, <laughs> character-based education, top-down, uh, with teachers being these kind of models. And if you wanted model citizens, you needed extreme selection. So when you, if you wanted to be a teacher, to you, if you wanted to be accepted into teacher seminars, you needed to go through all these uh, tests that lasted for days. You needed to go through, I mean, medical examinations. And if you were lucky enough to, uh, to get in, well, then there were significantly draconian rules for teacher students. They were not allowed to smoke. I think they were allowed. I think that's wrong. I think they were allowed to drink because they like drinking. I don't think they would ban that. <laughs> they were not allowed to go dancing. They had to dress in a certain way. And dating rules. They, there were stories, if you read these uh, accounts, from Tornio up in northern Finland when Swedish men came over the borders. And apparently some of them had been uh, caught. Some of the women, the female students, had been caught meeting up with them and they were expelled. They, they, they did have this idea that um, teachers should get together and, and marry each other. So you would have model couples of the model citizens. Right? So, so this is the kind of, this is the education that many teachers had gone through at the time when Finland starts improving. In, uh, in international tests. Many of these, obviously most of them, were they were gradually abolished, these rules for teacher students, after the Second World War, but some of them were actually there for, for two decades after. Okay? And also important, I mean, teacher, if you look at teachers, their education levels, specifically primary school uh, teachers, they were comparatively highly educated already prior to World War II, a high, very high number of of teachers who had uh, upper secondary school diplomas, an unusually high degree of the primary school teachers. And the, the, the point here is that what I'm trying to make is that teacher status is primarily due to social historical factors, not their current teacher education. Now, this does not mean that Finnish teachers are not good, because they are. We have evidence now from PIAC, which is kind of a PISA-like uh, test for grown-ups, and they've actually uh, recently uh, done the study and see which teachers, which countries are performing the best. Finland stands out. Okay, they perform well, and I argue that's because of old reasons and social historical factors, not their current education. Supported slightly by this, I think, is this natural experiment of the Finland Swedes, as they are known. The Finland Swedes, of course, I mentioned this briefly before, was the historical, political, and cultural elite. Okay? Um, the big difference since about 1900 is that they have been disproportionately overrepresented in the uh, middle classes. So as urbanization began around the coast, the Finland Swedes were already there. That's where they were settled. And they came to occupy slightly higher positions, such as foremen, to a higher extent than the ethnic Finns. And today, they are, on average, wealthier, they're healthier, they live longer, and they're more educated, slightly more educated on average. And there were some, obviously, again, 
the Swedes were very important for creating the Fenomen nationalist movement, but they, some of them didn't like this idea of giving up their entire identity. Some of them wanted to remain, uh, have a distinct nationality, and that was called the Svekomans, the Svekoman counter movement in 19th century. They basically put forward this idea of a country with two distinct nationalities, with different cultures, different languages, etc. And they, they basically, they li still lives on to a certain extent. You have the Swedish People's Party of Finland, where you have ethnic voting. 5% uh, of the vote in national uh, governments regularly participates in coalition governments. Um, but the point is that this movement had an existing culture to lean on. Okay, and in that situation, I argue that teachers were not as important as for ethnic Finns. They were important because they've had their own education system, the Finland Swedes. Um, and that was obviously partly to protect their culture, but protecting something that already exists is slightly different from creating something that doesn't exist. So I argue that teachers were not as important as for ethnic Finns. And incidentally, you look at the application statistics, this is just one uh, snapshot, but right before the, uh, the uh, uh, financial crisis, you had about 14% of Finnish first choice applicants accepted. So this 10% headline kind of thing that you hear in the media, not necessarily true all the time. It depends on how you look at the application statistics and how it's aggregated. And it, uh, they have different application systems in different parts of, in different uh, universities, which they now have centralized, so it's a bit easier. But the point is, with about 14%, you compare that with 40% of all applicants among Finland Swedes, including second, uh, secondary applicants. Some people have said, well, that's because Finland Swedes have to go to and become teachers in Vasa, which is a bit more remote up in Ostrobotnia. Uh, they don't want to do that, so people don't really want to go there, and that's why they have you know, lower application rates. I looked at the kindergarten, because now since 2011 they have a kindergarten education, teacher education in Helsinki. Uh, I think it's 2014, you have 16% of the applicants who sit the test, because you have to sit a test to get in. Um, among the Finnish speakers get in versus 59% of Swedish speakers. So it appears as if the teacher profession is not as attractive among Finland Swedes, and you compare this with medicine, I mean the application statistics in medicine, very similar. It appears as if teaching is not that highly regarded among the Finland Swedes. It's not low, I don't want to say it's low status in Finland Sweden, or fi sorry, Swedish Finland. Um, but it's not as high. And this is what might be one reason why Finland and Swedes, despite higher socioeconomic background, on average perform worse in both national and international tests. One example is PISA 2009, 14 points lower in maths, and then you see 27 points lower in reading, 28 points lower in science. Same thing in national evaluation. So actually the gap in maths that, that has declined, that is gone by now but all the other gaps essentially remain. Uh, also in national evaluations, which are able to find out that these are consoles in history and other subjects, and these are not small. I mean, 27 points, that's essentially two-thirds of a, sorry, three-fourths of, of uh, one uh, academic year of learning, okay? So, I argue that these historical factors were incredibly important for setting the stage, so to speak, for this kind of educational miracle as it became known later in the 2000s. But I, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, sufficient. It was necessary but not sufficient. And uh, it's important to consider the socioeconomic changes that were going on in Finland from the 1960s onwards especially. Because after World War II, Finland is dirt poor. Okay? It basically in 1945, 30% of people in Sweden, Denmark, Norway work in agriculture and forestry. It's 60% in Finland. This is a late urbanizer, it's a late industrializer, and it also developed the welfare state slightly later. It always lagged Scandinavia in those respects up until recently. But then something happens, and what we see is an East Asian style catch up. This is the rel relative GDP per capita trajectory of Finland. You see, they're about 60, 1950, they're about 60% of Sweden and Denmark, very much poorer. 
and about 80% of Norway. And then you see that something happens in the mid-1960s, that's the intensification of the so-called Great Migration, which was a huge population movement from the peripheral regions into the urban south. You also see a significant labor emigration to Sweden and, and basically populated our factories for a while. Huge, hugely important also for Sweden. So you see, they, they just radically improve. And then the, up until the 90s, they almost, they're almost, they've almost catched up, uh, caught up. But then the crisis occurs in the early 90s. It hits Finland much, much more significantly than any other Nordic country. Um, it was worse than the Great Depression in Finland, this crisis. Uh, partly be also because of the Soviet Union collapsing, Finland had big trade relations, as, which was unique among genuinely democratic countries with the Soviet Union. Um, and then you see, right, after the, right before the financial crash, you see they, they caught up. And this story, I mean, what happens here is that education starts moving in tandem with improving, or education results starts moving in tandem with improving uh, socioeconomic conditions. I mean, the, and what do you think about the PISA generation, the first PISA generation? I mean, they were, they were the generation benefiting from having much more highly educated parents, richer parents. The intergenerational gaps in Finland are some of the largest in Europe, partly because of this gigantic cataclysmic change that went on. Uh, and it is more East Asian. And I argue that's probably important. And in these type of transformations, you also tend to see a, a strong culture of hard work. Uh, the idea here, which there's some evidence for, which I outline in the book, is that social norms of effort and work tend to follow this inverted U-curve as a function of income and welfare. So in the beginning, when you're poor, you want to work hard, you want to make sure that your kids you know, uh, go through education, do, do good for themselves, and end up uh, richer than they were. At some point, I argue, there is a threshold where we get a bit lazy. We want our kids to uh, have fun in school. They shouldn't be as stressed as they were, for good reasons, perhaps. That, that's a different story. But I argue, and eventually start to fall. And I argue that what you see there in the beginning of these, uh, this, this uh, uh, huge improvement in economic outcomes and educational outcomes is that culture kicking in. And in Finland, I mean, I argue that this definitely shaped Finnish culture. And in Finland, there is this word for it, specifically, a specific word for it called CISO, which is not really, you can't really translate it into, into uh, other languages, but it's about you know, determination and resolute, resoluteness in, in um, uh, times of adversity. And this essentially means, you know, hard work, hard work, hard work. And you know, uh, it, it came to, uh, to characterize the, well, be very important for the Finnish character, already in World War II, it was previous during nationalist fervor, coined, the modern definition of the word was coined then. And this is also more East Asian style. And you can see this actually in the World Value Survey. You see that the share who said that determinism and perseverance is an important quality to teach children is 51% around 2000. This is compared to about 30% in Scandinavia and actually increased from 1990. And I argue that's probably due to this uh, uh, significant economic crisis uh, that made it very, very important to work hard in Finland because they had about 22% unemployment uh, in the beginning or uh, mid 1990s. Also similar to the East Asian is that they've had a more introvert and, uh, than, I mean, Scandinavia, more introvert culture, it's more agrarian. And one educational soci sociologist, a sociologist, Hanu Simela, has called it an authoritarian, obedient, and collectivist mentality that characterizes uh, the Finnish society. I think this is too harsh, but this is not my, th these are not my words. He, 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 uh, he, he claims that this is, this is going on. There's something to it, but there are extroversion scores from a couple of decades ago, which I found, which shows that Finland actually scores the lowest in Europe on par with Japan and Hong Kong when it comes to extroversion. Norway and Iceland, the, the, the uh, Nordic countries that are in, are in this survey, they score more, much more similar to America and some of the highest in Europe. Um, so I argue that's probably important. There's actually a joke in Finland, and you know, fin Finnish people actually say this about themselves. If you ask them, they say, well, we're quite silent, you know? And, uh, and there's a joke in Finland when they say, okay, two guys haven't seen each other for a very long time, okay? And they meet on the street, and they decide, we're gonna catch up. We go to the pub, okay? 
They have one drink. Drink. Silence. Not a word. They have a second drink. Silence, not a word. And right before the third beer, they're going to have, one of them raises their glass and says, Kyppje, which if I pronounce it wrong, I don't know. But it means cheers. And the other guy looks at him and says, are we here to talk or to drink? <laughs> That's their own joke. It's not mine. OK? So they have internalized that attitude as well. So you can see there's probably some truth to it, to these extroversion scores. So what I argue is that there was a wealth effect that probably catapulted Finland scores upwards from the mid-1960s onwards, and also, I argue, probably sustained them longer because of the 1990s crisis when it was incredibly important to work hard. There is some evidence from that. I mean, I wouldn't call it evidence, but it's consistent with the results in PIAC from Sweden, Denmark, and Norway. You see that the countries that are that are uh, hit hardest by the economic crisis, you see this largest uptick in, <laughs> in scores. So my generation happens to be the ones who perform best in PIAC in Sweden, and we were the ones educated in the beginning of the crisis. Then you see Denmark and Norway, which of course have, have, has um, oil, completely cushioned the crisis. You just see falling through generations. This is not, this is just indicative, so I don't want to highlight it too much, but it's definitely, I, I think there's something there. Also importantly, this culture, which I just outlined, this more traditional agrarian uh, uh, culture, is also reflected in a, quite a hierarchical nature of, of schools. Um, traditionally and historically in Finland, there's been very little uh, pupil influence and essentially no school democracy. There were some attempts right before the, uh, the comprehensive school reform, but they, had, they were aborted after that, because partly because teachers hated them. They did not want to give power, any power, to pupils. They were the authorities in the classroom, and that's how they wanted it to remain. Okay? In just uh, one snapshot here, there's more in the book, but in the International Civic Survey, 2009, 15% of pupils of Finnish 14-year-olds uh, say that they take part in any decision-making regarding how their school is run. This is the lowest of all 38 countries in the world, or, sorry, 38 countries in the survey, England is 55%, Sweden also 50%, 60%, Norway similar. This is the lowest. Nine, also 2009, Finnish UNICEF went out and wrote about this, this lack of pupil influence, um, that they had no say in how schools are run and how, you know, certain things. And they linked that to this, what they call, extremely negative attitudes towards teachers. Um, which, so, so if you don't have any influence, you, would be, you, you wouldn't like your teachers. So Finnish kids haven't liked their teachers that much if you ask them, but they learn well. Also reflected in low pupil happiness levels, you look at the recent uh, uh, PISA 2012 when they actually asked pupils, okay, are you happy at school? Some of the lowest in the world, they learn well, they're not happy. Same thing in Estonia, Poland, Latvia. Germany's not that happy either. So you have that. They, there seems to be some, maybe some f form of a trade-off. But this is, just, this is just the culture that I'm outlining now. And Finnish researchers themselves have highlighted this in the sense of that, this is a quote also from some people that I cite in the book, uh, that obedience and authority have been key features of Finland's education system throughout its history. This goes back to uh, Eunus Igneus, who in his, in, 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 actually outlined that the main, the main responsibility of schools was to learn, teach uh, children to work hard and be obedient. That was the main responsibility of schools back then. And incidentally, Finland Swedish schools are much more Swedish. They have similar pupil happiness levels. They have much better relations with teachers. I also cite those sources in the book, you can see. Okay. Not only, I mean, this, I mean, this is obvious, this follows from the previous slide, which is that the culture is traditional. Well, you will probably find quite traditional methods. Again, Herbert Sillerism was key from the beginning, and it appeared to still cast its shadow as the 20th century was coming to an end. I cite a couple of both surveys but observations of quite a large number of schools, and uh, they come to the same conclusion. Teaching is quite traditional in Finland or has been at least, but 
this at the, at the, as, as the 20th century was coming to end, it was certainly uh, uh, traditional. This is one, actually, observation. The, an East Anglia research team was there in 96 to evaluate their, uh, what has happened to their national curriculum reform. It had been implemented in some of the schools. Kind of a catastrophe because they realized they hadn't done anything. They just decided when they got autonomy, they didn't change. They were just the same two years after. Oh, yeah. And this is what they said, whole classes following line by line what is written in the textbook, pace determined by the teacher, rows and rows of children all doing the same thing in the same way, whether it be art, mathematics, or geography. We have moved from school to school, seen almost identical lessons. You could have swapped the teachers over and the children would never have noticed the difference. We did not see much evidence of, for example, student-centered learning or independent learning. This is four years before these kids sit the PISA test. They went to about 50 schools, so it's not, you know, but these were chosen as the most, most innovative ones because they wanted to show the how, how, you know, that something has happened, but they just found that this was how it was. This, to me, looks more like a Bismarckian education factory, perhaps. I think, I think this is also quite cultural. They came with the assumption that, that they would have more of the child-centered learning. They should have gone to Sweden. I think, because there they would have seen a bit more, at least by then. But either way, this is, this is what they found, found, traditional teaching, and there's been a hierarchical culture. And incidentally, the research looking at test scores suggests that this is positive for results. Now, there is evidence from uh, America, randomized research, supporting the idea <laughs> that a hierarchical schooling culture can have strong positive effects on achievement, at least among more disadvantaged pupils. These are so-called no-excuse paradigm schools. Very strong emphasis on, on academic achievement, drill, 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 no excuses, discipline, etc. Might not be that fun, but this is randomized. It seems to be working. There's also some evidence they actually do better later on as well. Uh, but also, at least among more disadvantaged pupils. The thing is also, Finland has also been famous for having a very short tail, right? This might be one of the reasons. They do better often. And it doesn't surprise me that much because disadvantaged pupils tend to have a more less structured environment at home and outside of school, so maybe they would benefit from a more structured environment inside of school. When it comes to the traditional methods, we are also have more and more evidence coming out from the economics of education literature suggesting that, that traditional methods are quite good for learning in the, when it comes to these test scores. Again, not everything, but it's these test scores. So. But again, Finland is famous for the test scores. This is what we have to discuss. And um, that pupil-led methods can be absolutely disastrous. Quebec implemented a reform in early 2000 and has been evaluated recently by a couple of uh, uh, economists. And no, I mean, they found huge, I mean, significant declines in both national and international uh, 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 test scores and also significant worsening of behavior. So they, and, and they became hyperactive much more. When it comes to Sweden, there's actually no proper evidence for it. But we, I mean, we introduced pupil-led methods like crazy from the early 1990s onwards. Like cra it, it increased significantly. And I argue, if you look to Sweden, I recently wrote an article about this, it's the only plausible explanation that receives both support in the, in the literature as well as being consistent with the timeline. Because Sweden fell, I mean, so much between like 95 and 2003 that there's no plausible other explanation. And all the other explanations basically are rejected by the research. So I argue that's probably important as well. So the point here is that it's not only, this is, Tim said, of course it's education. It's the, the point is that it's the combination of historical factors and significant societal and economic changes, as should say there, as well as the retention of an old fashioned culture and attitudes that were likely important for Finland's rise. The fact is, they went so fast that culture didn't really catch up, uh, or it took time before it caught up, at least. But then, what about the fall? And now we're coming to the end here. Well, <coughs> Finland's culture is catching up with social and economic changes, unsurprisingly. Um, we know, I mean, between 2000 and 2009, we have the largest drop in the share of pupils who say that they read a lot, outside of school for fun. They have less learning-orientated attitudes according to new surveys between 2001 and 2012. Big drop in this. And also uh, attitudes that are deemed to be detrimental for learning obviously increased at the same time. 
changing values among parents, this is a bit more tentative, but we do have in, in World Value Survey that this idea that you should instill uh, in children the quality of obedience is decreasingly seen as something worthwhile in Finland. Uh, it decreased by about 30% between 2000 and 2009, I think. And also, more anecdotal is that parents appear to be more likely to pressure teachers today. There were many teachers complaining that this was something, and also some of the piece, well, Juni uh, Villagervi, who, or Villagervi, he also highlighted, I mean, if you look today, you definitely see that this is a much more common phenomenon than it was just 10, 15 years ago. But the culture is changing. We have more technology. Video games, also, of course, this is also due to post-industrialization, producing all these pressures, changing values. And just, again, a little bit of support for that story is that the, on average, wealthier Finland Swedes started to fall before the ethnic Finns. Incidentally, they were much less affected by the uh, 1990s crisis. So they, the, uh, an unemployment was much, much lower among the Finland Swedes, they did much better. And I argue then that most likely the Finland Swedes probably, I mean, they, they reached peak educational culture first, so they started to decline first, and now they have, the Finns are following, essentially. But it's not only true that it's the cultural change due to economic changes, there have been changing teacher methods. Because in the, in the, in the early 90s and mid-1990s, there were changes in education policy. There were an attempt, at least, there were attempts to change uh, methods and become more uh, kind of pro progressivist and, and child-centered. And, uh, you know, you read the Posse Solberg's work and say in the 94 curriculum there was a requirement that they should design their own curricula in accordance with, with these uh, attitudes. So they say, look, the Finnish education policy tends to highlight um, and emphasize uh, new, uh, you know, decreasingly traditional methods. That didn't really happen for a while, and that was because teachers completely ignored them. They, and ironically, they had the autonomy to do so. There was no, unlike in Sweden, where you had to implement these methods, in Finland, when they started to push for them, they withdrew much of the accountability and much of the centralized uh, ideas about how teaching should be done. So teachers had the right to just tell the um, education policy makers to bugger off. They did not want to do that, right? But eventually, with the retirement of the old teachers, eventually you'll see that this is going on. There's some evidence for this, specifically between 94 and 2007, you see a huge increase in the percentage of kids who say that the teacher is um, encouraging me to speak in the classroom. That wasn't the case. And it's been increasing, increasing, increasing. If, uh, and, and so eventually this will obviously change. So I argue that parts of the reforms in the 90s are probably uh, uh, linked to the, are the link to the decline, probably the cause of the decline, or one cause of the decline, and not the rise, okay? And what do you do about this? What's the solution in Finland? Well, they repeat Sweden's mistakes. Again, there's a saying in Finland, who say in education policy, we always make the same mistakes as Sweden, just 10 years after. But then with, with PISA, with the emergence of PISA, that was supposed to be gone. Because now we knew that we were good, and look at Sweden, they're just, they're just really bad, right? But it's more of the same, as always. Suddenly, now we should have more pupil influence. This is the national curriculum 2014 coming to effect next year. It stipulates, and I spoke, many teachers were worried about this. <laughs> in, in, they said, oh, I don't like it. The teacher should decide their methods together with the pupils. Compare this with the 2004 curriculum. The teacher decides the working methods. And the solution, the idea behind this is, of course, the same as the progressivist ideas all over the world. Namely, that uh, it, outside society, and the economics, post-industrialization is about freedom and it's about more uh, autonomy for individuals. And of course, we want them to have fun when they learn and so on and so forth. So the idea is we need to follow outside the outside world in education. But this is Hannah Arendt in 1964, wrote an essay about the crisis of education. The problem of education in the modern world lies in the fact that by its very nature, it cannot forego either authority or tradition. 
and yet must proceed in a world that is neither structured by authority nor held together by tradition. This is a paradox, as many things in modern politics, we're talking about paradox. We do not necessarily want the same freedoms in schools as we have outside, in, in the outside world. I love my freedoms, but maybe not give all of those freedom, freedoms to kids. Okay. And the research tends to support that as well. Final couple of implications for international comparisons. First thing, this best practice methodology has to be put on the dustbin of history to quote Lenin. It's useless, okay? It doesn't, it contributes to a lot of uh, craziness in the education world. It has to stop. And we must understand that PSEC scores do not measure education policy success. They measure one element of pupil success, one element, okay? But they do not measure education policy success, because there are many other reasons why pupils perform as they do. And this applies not only to Finland, because what I hear now, and I was in Estonia, spoke about this, I went to Poland and speak, spoke, spoke about this as well. This, now people want to go there and look at Estonia. I came to Estonia, and you know, what, what did you actually do after independence? Not, not that much, we're just good, I guess. Because they perform exceedingly well. Right? It's interestingly though, most of the improvements have been in the Russian speaking schools. But I, either way, also, but if you look at Poland, Germany, and Estonia, specifically Poland and Estonia, same thing there. They, they cast off the kind of communist shackles, starting to improve their growth significantly, improving education. They're also on the curve upwards towards the threshold. Germany, why is Germany improving? If you look and disaggregate the scores, most, I mean, the most radical improvements occurred in East Germany. East Germany, or German students top the uh, internal uh, domestic evaluations now, and they improved much more radically. There's some evidence that the West German students are now falling since 2009, okay? Also important, I argue that the only way to really get to the causal aspects of things, I argue, when it comes to the evidence of, of linking education policy to uh, 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 outcomes, is that we need more experimental or quasi-experimental research. That's not perfect, but that's de definitely something we need to do in order to separate causation from correlation. But then you notice something, of course, because I, mean, I haven't done that. I haven't done that. And you can't randomize cultural traits. You can't randomize the economic development. You can't randomize these things. So at the end of the day, I'm just open and I say, it's just a story, but I argue that it's a better story backed up by evidence, unlike the previous stories. So it's better than the ones before. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much.